going to read her bio, uh, which will be a, a tiny symbol to an amazing story, um, her brief bio. So this is actually what I, I had written down for the article I wrote years ago, but um, Hesse received degrees in chemistry from Barnard College in Columbia University. She spent <laughs> most of her career um, at Educational Testing Service in Princeton, New Jersey, where she was in charge of national chemistry and biology examinations. After moving to New York, um, and you'll hear her journey of getting to New York, she taught chemistry at St. John's University in Queens, New York until 2015. Um, she is sought out as a leading expert on water conservation. Uh, she and her husband, Earl Taft, who is a retired mathematics professor, I believe at Rutgers, uh, he was there for many years, um, now live in San Francisco full-time near their children. Um, so with that said, the way the evening is going to be structured is Hesse is going to spend about 20 minutes sharing her extraordinary story. And then um, Rabbi Dr. Michael Berenbaum, also a beloved TBA member, um, for those of you who don't know um, Michael Berenbaum, he is also the director of the uh, Siggy Ziering Institute. He's a professor. Um, and he actually crossed paths with Hesse years ago because when he was um, the project director of the U.S. Holocaust Museum, he also was the um, director of the uh, Holocaust Museum's Research Institute over in DC. He actually was there when they took uh, Hesse's oral history. So when I told Michael about Hesse, he was like, yes, I remember when we took her story. So that was really cool to be reunited again. Um, so with that said, we'll, uh, how about we go ahead and make sure if everybody could, except for you, of course, Hesse, um, if you could mute yourselves, um, put it on um, participant view. I'm going to try and spotlight you, Hesse. Hopefully, can I just get some thumbs up? Is Hesse on the main? Okay, terrific. So Hesse, why don't you just go ahead and, and share your story as you have done many times for many news publications and um, it is our honor to have you here tonight. And uh, and Michael Berenbaum is waiting to be admitted. So um, after you're done, we'll I'll, we'll turn it over to him, Hesse. But go ahead, you have uh, 20 minutes and I'll let you know how about five minutes, um, at, at 15 minutes in, how about I just give you a heads up? Okay, sounds good. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank Leah and the temple, uh, for letting me, inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'm very eager to talk to people who should realize that the Holocaust, when they're going to rewrite history when people like me are no longer around. So I'd like to work the to tell people what, what happened in one tiny part of and the collection. So let's start with my parents. My parents, can you show their picture, please? Yeah. Do you see the photo or no? No. Okay, oh, sorry, one second. Uh, ah, here we go. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, there we go. These are my parents in Berlin in the mid-1930s. Mid um, they were a remarkable couple. Without my father's astute ingenuity, cleverness, and with God's help, of course, I would not be talking to you today. Um, my parents were born in Latvia and came to Germany to study. My father was going to study engineering, which his father set up. He came from a prominent family in Latvia, but he spoke German mostly. 
Oh, my mother came from a very large family as well, and had a, was known as a girl with a golden voice, and she studied in Riga voice. My father in Berlin later was also with a, a strong voice performance was uh, sponsored by some local people there who encouraged him to go to the opera. And he, um, I got a contract to sing in the National Opera in Breslau, 19 leading operas, until they found out in 1932 that his stage name, which was Yasha Lenson, was really, his real name was Yikam Levinson, and they canceled the contract. That was the first sign that they felt of anti-Semitism against Jews. I, shortly after I was born, my parents moved into a very lovely apartment in the center of Berlin. And my mother, when I was about eight or well, nine months old, my mother took me to a photographer to have a baby picture taken. Like all our parents, they took the photograph and placed it on the piano, a particularly valuable piano, which my father bought my mother as a gift when I was born. That piano, by the way, is currently in New York, in our apartment in New York. One day, my mother met the cleaning woman who came up and said, you know, Mrs. Levinson, I saw a Hesse in the picture of the magazine. And yeah. that's the picture. And my mother at first said, no, 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 I don't believe it. It's impossible. She said, give me the money and I'll bring you the magazine. So she did. And this is what she found. The Sonnein's house, which means the son of that home, and who is a typical Aryan child. My parents were horrified. My mother went to the photographer and asked him, what happened? He took her to the back room, closed the doors, and said that the Ministry of Propaganda, run by Goebbels in Germany, had ordered a beauty contest of the most beautiful Aryan babies. They asked the 10 most prominent photographers in Germany to submit their 10 best pictures. And the photographer told my mother, and I submitted your baby. My mother said, but you know this is a Jewish child. And he said in German, which I'll never forget, I was told many times in my lifetime. Yes, but I wanted to allow myself the pleasure of his joke. Yeah, but she wanted to be the spouse allowed them. After that, my mother came back and my parents really got terrified. My life changed considerably. I could no longer go to the Tiergarten, which my aunt Masha, my dear aunt Masha, took me to all the time. Because if anybody asked me my name, I would say it. I was just beginning to talk. I'd say my name, Nancy Levinson. If anybody had asked me, I wouldn't be here today. There's so many steps in which I could have not made it. So the, the, incredible, the incredible thing, the incredible thing is that um, the myth of Aryan baby got exploded, and you became, as it were, a quasi-public figure while still an infant. Right. The fact is that within days, the body's children's by a clothing store and my picture in the window saying, buy beautiful clothes for your baby. Um, at one point, my friend went to visit another friend outside of Berlin 
she had it framed on the wall, unaware that this was a Jewish child. And the big thing is that for my first birthday, my father's sister, Ida, who lived in Vilnius, went in to buy a baby picture and she found my that photograph copied as a birthday card. She went over and asked the uh, proprietor of the store, where did you get this card? And she said, oh, it's a German, a Berliner baby. It's not a doll, it's a real baby from Berlin. Uh, my aunt didn't say anything. She bought the card and sent it to her. So it says, happy birthday, Marty's birthday. And so I led a very restricted, quarantine life. Um, people have often wondered, how come I won this contest? I'm not blonde and blue eyed, no blue eyed. My answer has always been, neither was Hitler. <laughs> so anyway, um, there were other incidents that happened in Germany at the time. Since my parents had, my father had to give up voice, they went to the Latvian consulate to ask what he advised. He said, oh, Hitler's just a madman, it will pass. You're okay in Germany. It's a very progressive country. When I leave, I'll tell you to leave. Well, it wasn't that easy. My father went into a business <coughs> and did very well. But one day was arrested for some fraudulent scheme and that had to do with the taxes which were non-existent. And the Nazis burst into his office and grabbed him and he said he's under arrest. The accountant that was with him was a card-carrying Nazi, but very devoted to my parents. So he took a car and said, follow that cab, a Hollywood-style style type of chase to Berlin until he got to the police station, banked his way into the courtroom and yelled out Heil Hitler and said he vouches for this man. And so my father was released. But things were getting very tough. At the end of 1936, uh, my sister was born in Berlin. At the time, it was already, the edict had been passed. And every boy that's born had to be named David and every girl, Sarah. Now my parents, not being citizens of Germany, were not bound to that rule. And they didn't like the name Sarah, but they wanted to maintain the Jewish nature of what was being done here. So they picked the name Naomi, which is from the Bible. And my sister, who is joining us in Zoom tonight, is on live, I think. She can wave. Can yeah. she wave? No, I mean, can you wave? There she is. <laughs> yeah. Would you like me to share the photo with you and your sister? Excuse me? Yeah. Are, would you like me to share the photo with you and your sister? Or are we not there yet? Sure. Okay. Oh, not quite yet. Not quite yet. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, when, when, at that point, when he, he named her, they called her Noemi, some big government official came into the bed next to my mother and gave the woman a big bonus cash and congratulations for her German baby. And then bypassed my mother altogether with the baby. So the German nurse turned over to the baby and said, and you, my little baby, 
your Jewish father will take care of you. And indeed he did. So we left Germany shortly after that, decided it was not safe anymore. And we went to Latvia in the summer of 37. We spent six months, I'm sure it was earlier, we spent almost eight months there. My father went to Paris and got us a magnificent apartment near the uh, Parc Monceau. And we moved to Paris in the beginning of 38. Then in 1938, I unfortunately don't have pictures of us in Paris. I have many of them in New York, but I do have one picture that now I would like you to share. It was the photo I shared before? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, this is a very famous picture. Famous for us because it's very significant. Let me first say that in the summer of 1939, my parents had a big argument in, uh, in Paris. Yes. My mother insisted that she wanted to go back to Latvia for her mother, for the, her mother to see her grandkid. That she has a right to see the grandkid. My father said, no way are you going to cross Germany by train now one day. My mother said she doesn't get involved in politics. She's just going to play with the kids. They're going to hear you speak German. And my father said, no way you're going to go. It turns out to be very fateful that my father won this argument. Because this picture was taken at a beach resort in France the summer of 1939 instead. It was on the back of the photo, it says Villiers, August 20, 1939. In other words, I was 12 days before Hitler invaded Poland. If two of the two of us had been on the other side of the border, we would have been killed together with all of our family, our grandmothers, our aunts, uncles, and cousins, everybody on the other side was killed. The two cousins survived the concentration camp. It was very tough. So fortunately for us, we were saved, but we can imagine lots of little kids that just like that who were sent to concentration camps landed up on the other side. Life in Paris got tough to eventually. Um, my, at one point, I had a runny nose, a knee infection. And during those days, doctors made a house call. And there was a doctor, Levy, who came to the house and commented on what a cute kid I was. So the, my mother immediately took the data picture. She took three copies of the magazine folded in opera scores, scores of operas that she sang. She folded in three different copies of the magazine. She showed it to Dr. Levy, and he said, oh my God, this is perfect for me to show my friends. I have a, my good friends who run Paris Soir, which is uh, Francois today. Anyway, he wanted to show them how ridiculous the Nazi philosophy is. My father stopped them. He said, no way are you going to make this public. You can't have a picture. And very faithfully, he said, oh, Monsieur Levinson, mais vous n'avez rien à craindre. Vous n'êtes en France, vous êtes en France maintenant. Which means, you have nothing to worry about. You're in France now. Well, the history has proved my father right again. Life was quiet where there were many small, scary incidents after Paris fell in 1940, especially me and me speaking German on the street. 
And also we brought with us the German governors that my parents hired before Noemi to take care of me before Noemi was born. So we all, she was notorious and not learning other languages. And we all spoke German on the streets. But one day, another fateful event occurred. In France, many of the buildings have concierge, which means like a house manager or super, if you will, that lives in the building on the first floor. That concierge had gotten very friendly with one of she liked my father's friend, George, who was also from Latvia. Now, one fateful Sunday, my father walked out and said, Bonjour, Madame so-and-so. We're going to George's house today. Oh, have a good time. That was an innocent exchange. Until later that day, there was a call at George's house from the concierge. She said the Nazis were here. They were looking for you. They said they'd come back. I suggest you don't. So that was the beginning, beginning of the end of our stay in Paris. My father found a place in the free zone, south of Bordeaux, a little village called Mais Max sur Mer, where he sent my mother, Noemi and I, to a pension there. And he stayed and slept on the couch in George's house. But he went back at great risk daily to pack up the Paris apartment. Primarily, the three famous paintings for my grandfather. My mother's father had been a painter. He died when she was very young. He was also a husband, but his paintings were the only memories that my mother had of him. And the piano. And so my father packed up everything, including like, beautiful dishes and silverware and everything that he packed up and had it shipped to Portugal, which at the time was not yet involved in the German access. And he couldn't stored in the storage place in Lisbon. Meanwhile, we were having difficult times in Bordeaux. One very significant, I will skip some of the many detailed incidents, but one very significant uh, incident that I'd like to tell you is one afternoon we were at the beach with my mother Noemi and I, and a German soldier came up and he heard us talking. And he said to my mother, Die Kinder sprechen Deutsch? And my mother said, Oh, that's because we had a German governess in Paris, so they learned German. He went over to us, he came over to us, and he said to Noemi, what's your name? And she gave it to him, and she was forced. And he said, Boss, Levinson? And Noemi acted like he's an idiot, he doesn't understand. And she said, yes, Levinson, she insisted. <laughs> she almost got us killed. <laughs> she was four years old. She was... I'm just not uh, just four. But the officer went back to my mother and said, you know, I think it would be very useful to us in the office if we use translators and you can help us translate what we take you with, uh, with us today. And my mother said, Oh, I'm very bad at translating. I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And for some reason the officer looked at us and looked at the my mother and the kid, and he said, okay for today, but I'll be back. So, of course, we never went back to the beach. At the pension, my mother got a call from the pension leader who said, um, I can't keep you here anymore. I've tried, there have been difficulties before. 
but you've got to leave. I'm getting into trouble. I can't have you here. You've got to leave by tomorrow morning. And my mother thought this is the end because what is she going to do with two kids and a couple of suitcases on the road? She didn't have a car. Those were the days before cell phones or any kind of contact with my father. And she said she was up crying all night. When at four o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on the door. But she said, Monsieur Levinson, Madame Levinson, votre mari est arrivé. At four in the morning, my, my father had pulled up to the pension. What happened? That was the night when he finally left Paris. In all extraordinary circumstances, he filled up with gas. He didn't stop for a pee, for anything. He just drove and drove and drove until all night, until he got to the pension. Just right. a heads up, Hesse, five, uh, no rush, but uh, about five more minutes until Michael, if you'll uh, start the conversation. Okay. So after that, we went to, we managed to get out to cross the danger zone towards Nice. Uh, and eventually cross the air road with a truck where we had to get out of the truck, a meat truck took us down. But we had to cross a safety zone and the zone and meet the guy at the other end. Um, we meant running through the woods and we had to be very quiet. I was very scared that the guy who took who sent us abroad was going to cut off our tongue, he said, before anybody makes any noise. Anyway, we clearly made it to the other side. We arrived in East, and then he got a note a, from a friend in Paris that said, you got a thick letter from the American Embassy, from the State Department. By the time we received that letter to Nice, indeed, it was an immigration visa. But it said on there, if not uh, arrived on U.S. soil within 90 days of issuance, this visa is not on board. 45 days had passed. My father knew very well that we couldn't make a range to get across the submarine Atlantic in 45 days. So he wired, came to Washington for an extension. And it came back stamped, denied. So it's not thanks to Uncle Sam that I'm sitting here today. What to do next? My father went hunting all over the place for visas to Latin America. Everyone turned him down except Cuba. Cuba said, okay, I'll give you four visas for enough money, of course. And that's how we got to Cuba. Um, it was very difficult. To, to get passage out of Nice to Marseille, to the Pyrenees, into Spain, and into Portugal, uh, to catch a boat to Havana. We were, there was a very interesting story about rescuing Goethe, but I guess I don't have time for that now. Um, we got to the next to the last boat to leave Europe, the beginning of 1942. This was uh, the Set Papinto, is the name of the boat, and it contained a basement full of refugees piled on mattresses. Fortunately, we had a cabin for uh, all of us to sleep. It took 21 days to take a southern route 
of the Atlantic where we were mined. Um, we were we picked up Gata again in Morocco where the boat stopped after my father had arranged for our escape. And so we sailed and landed in Cuba. Do I have time to go on or do you want to say our next thing? All right, we arrived in Cuba and what to do now? It was a strange country, strange language. My father knew English, of course, but he went to all the bank he needed a loan to get started because he had spent all his money bribing the Cuban and getting out of Europe and getting a cabin on the boat. So he went from bank to bank and they all asked him, of course, for collateral. And he said, I, I have no collateral on myself. I'm an honest man. And of course they laughed at him, that's not how a bank operates. Until one day, he walked into the bank, Royal Bank of Canada. And there the agent said, you know what? I like your face. I trust you. I'm going to give you a loan. My father not only repaid the loan, but went campaigning for the Royal Bank of Canada, wherever they wanted him to go. Um, years later, when we were in New York, he went and campaigned for the bank with a heart. And he was very well known. So we got ourselves established in Cuba. It was very difficult adjusting to Cuba, um, but eventually we found a, again a very lovely apartment. You can show the next picture. Is this the picture with you in the rocking chair? Right. With the dog. All right. This was our apartment in Havana in a very lovely area. My father was very, very busy in Havana. His big job was His big job was to obtain, to help establish the State of Israel. In 1947, that vote was going to come up at the United Nations. And my father worked tirelessly to campaign for Cuba's vote for partition to establish the State of Israel, which he felt was key to having Jews recognize have a place of their own, or Jews will be always wanting. Needless to say, my father worked and worked and they, but that they promised they would, at the last minute they didn't. But, but fortunately, partition came through. I would like to emphasize very uh, urgently that I am an ardent Zionist, like my father. I'm going to carry on his legacy until I pass away. Zionism, the establishment of Israel, regardless of the government, is critical and foremost in my life, and it should be that of every Jew in the future. We have bad enough government in this country too, and we don't abandon it. Similarly, Israel, whether the government is pleasant or not, is beside the point. They need to have their security. And whoever promises them security for life has got my support and the Israeli support. Even though it's the biggest democracy in the Middle East and we are critical of themselves with their government, let them handle it. They know what they're doing. 
Creed is our obligation in the diaspora to help them survive. And survival there means different things from what it does mean in elsewhere. I mean, the anti-Semitism in Europe is endemic. I will always stay there. I'm hoping that this country can escape further issues as such. Today, Jesse, how long did your how long did you stay in Cuba? Excuse me. How long, how long did you stay in Cuba? When did your family leave Cuba? We left when we got the next uh, immigration visa. As it turned out, that was 1948. We got the visa. We came to the United States, but we didn't stay. We just accepted our residency and then went back to Cuba for a year until my father could set up again. Um, and you were there from 42 to 49, right? We were there from 1942 to 1949, basically. And my father, one important thing in Cuba that he did is he obtained, he found out first he didn't want to go into the pineapple business, but that he couldn't compete with Hawaii. So he found that the Cubans were throwing away all the entrails and the gut of cattle, which was a big industry in Cuba at the time. He was able to make casings for tennis rackets and for sausages. He managed a phenomenal plant, which he bought, to, he bought land right outside of Havana and set up a factory that uh, became very well known. When we decided to leave in 1949, because my father eventually wanted Noemi and I to grow up and marry Jews, which we both did, by the way. And not live the life of the mistresses and that respectable wives have. How to bear in Cuba. Um, and what did your parents do in the United States then? Excuse me? What did your folks do in the United States? What did your father do in the United States? Well, my father tried to start over again. His business, he kept his business by, um, in Cuba for a while by bringing over a friend of his that he found after the war in, Cuba, in Europe. Charles Sultan came to Havana to manage a factory. My father did the exporting part of the business there. But then Castro came along and Castro nationalized everything. So my father had to start all over again in the United States yet again. And he was managing to import and export, to, to import machinery that does printing of certain kind magazines and his business again flourished. Everyone felt very sorry for my father in New York having to start all over again for about the fourth time in his life. But he was an optimist and he said, if I survived Hitler, I can survive Castro. Eventually, he became, he became very well established in New York, but it was tough for years. We hardly had enough money to, for instance, there was no money to send us to college other than public college. Um, Hesse, I want to yeah. mention I have the two other photos. I know one is the family photo around the Seder table. Did you want me, I know that's kind of down the road, but did you want me to share that photo so we could see the family? Okay. This is a, the Seder table and your father is in there or? My father and his two grandchildren, Alex and Nina, those are my two kids. 
and my husband, Earl, who is here watching this with me now, and my dear Aunt Marsha, who made it to the United States in front of her, right in front of Earl. She took me to the zoo in Berlin. And next to Alex is me and then my mother. I got in 1981 at the time. Again. It was a very wonderful to be united and I was family in But eventually, um, I got through various contacts. I got to go to Israel. And in Israel, I, I met a soldier in New York who said my story belongs in Yad Vashem, the Memorial Museum in Jerusalem. Um, he introduced me to someone there. And they were very eager to have the photo. And you can show the last, my last photo now. And then um, if you want to submit some questions in the chat box for Hesse, um, Michael, if you don't mind just keeping an eye out for them and, and picking a, uh, out whichever ones you want to share. But here's the last photo. This is the photo of the original magazine as you recognize. And this is me in front of the, uh, in, of the museum in Israel in 1914 when I donated the picture. What's interesting is there's one very important point that I probably omitted or maybe it wasn't obvious. My father wanted to keep this story quiet all his life. He, he never spoke about it never talked about it, never discussed it, no friends ever knew about it, until 1987. And in 1987, I wrote part of, I wrote one chapter. I was invited to contribute a chapter of a book called The Jews of Latvia, I remember. And I first told the story. Um, however, it really only became widely public in the world. It occurred to me, they asked me, Dear Vashem, do you mind if the newspaper, Yediyoda Hadonot, comes to the ceremony where I handed over the magazine to the museum? And generally, I don't like publicity, but I thought, well, in Israel, why not? Let them know that. I donate the stuff where it belongs. So it was published in, the, in that newspaper. And lo and behold, Bild, the German newspaper, Bild, who reads, they read Hebrew, and they had an office in Tel Aviv. They called onto the picture and it went viral after that. The entire week, I was deluged with pictures, with photographs, questions with invitations to speak. I speak where I can, as I told you at the beginning, because it's important for people to realize exactly one little tiny story, one more survivor. But I want to say in particular that I'm curious because I don't know this about the family either. Um, where in Latvia was our family from? They were from a town called Lef uh, Lefaya in that Lebo in German. And uh, it was near the beach. It was on the beach. My mother went to Riga to study. Voice. My father went to Berlin to study engineering, and eventually they got married in Latvia, and I brought my mother to New York, to Berlin, and that's how they got started. Let me um, let me add that um, 
we came across the picture at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and we thought that one of the incredible ironies was that here you had in Germany the Aryan baby of the year was a Jewish baby. And as Hesse said so beautiful, uh, so beautifully, the whole concept of what made a beautiful Aryan baby uh, was farcical. Uh, as your father said, uh, Hitler was not exactly blonde haired and blue eyed. Uh, and though he loomed large, he was a short man. Uh, and here you had a young uh, Jewish girl who became that. And we have a copy of that in the archives of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We exhibited it uh, during one of our um, elements with one of our exhibitions on children and what happened to the fate of children. And where did you grow up in New York, in New York City, Hesse? You grew up in New York? On Riverside Drive. And what did you? And then where did you go to school? And what did you do when you came to the states? Well, I went to school in a public school, but I had such a good background from Cuba where I went to a British school, so I had such strong background that I only stayed in high school for two years, which was horrible. I hated it. Massive, large school where students were giving each other shots in the high school, in the bathroom. But I landed up at Barnard College early, two years after we got here. I think, again, I think Hesse has a, an absolutely remarkable story. Uh, the interesting thing about the story is keep it in mind as you read the of the background of the new Secretary of uh, Homeland Security. His family also got to Cuba at this point uh, and then had to flee Cuba for the United States. His mother is a Holocaust survivor from Romania. And remember that Cuba was the place that turned away Jews in 1939 with the, um, SA, with the MS St. Louis and that is the bribes were not high enough. So one of, the remark one of the remarkable things again is the degree to which your father understood what was required in order to survive, which was a sense of uh, conniving and uh, uh, strength and courage and imagination. Uh, the other part of the P Portugal story is, remember that Portugal was neutral as was Spain. And Portugal then became the last way station uh, to the West uh, because the, um, the only other places you could come get to the United States from or even to Cuba from was either Portugal, perhaps Spain or else Great Britain. So it's, it's quite, it's quite a, a um, remarkable um, uh, story. Now you're asked how many how many languages do you speak? Oh, it depends on five or six, depending on how you rate them. I speak obviously English and Spanish and French like English, uh, Russian a little less. Uh, Russian I can understand and speak, but I don't read it and write it very fluently, although I do. Now we have a question from Rachel Green, who said, I read a novel called The German Girl based on your famous baby photo that includes some elements of your story. Do novelists ask you for permission to uh, use parts of your story? And are you aware of any other novels or books that use your story? Am I aware of <laughs> any, any novels or books? that use your story? Yes, I am. Um, the, um, uh, in the separate schools in the United States where they teach the Holocaust in, in time, and they sent me like 30, 35, 40 copies of my picture, which they want me to autograph 
so that they can give it to each student in the class. That's happened on several occasions, mostly in the United States, where people uh, use the story to uh, teach a Holocaust in, in schools. Those are the areas I am most eager to support because I want students to know about that. Do you know this book, The German Girl? No. Oh. Hello, everyone. I'm Nina. I'm Hesky's daughter. I'm just going to jump in to help with some of the chat Zoom stuff. We don't actually know this book, The German Girl. So thank you very much, Rachel, for letting us know. Um, I, I bought it at Target. It was on the Target recommended paperbacks list. I don't remember the author. The, es the essence of the story is to put Hesse, this girl who's been made famous as an infant for looking Aryan, to put her on the St. Louis and then telling the story of the St. Louis. Although this character gets off of the St. Louis in Cuba and then it follows Cuban history. So it includes the time that Hesse was in Cuba and some other time, all, some time after that also. But uh, I'll, I can send the info to Leah if you'd like. Or Thank you. you. That would be great. Yeah. You know, the story of the St. Louis is one more reason why the illustration of how important it is for Israel to exist. I can't right. emphasize it at all strongly enough. Lori, uh, Lori um, uh, Kenner's uh, said the author is Armando Lucas Correa. So uh, you can you can look I, up. I got the it. Book. Thank you very much. You can, you can look. Um, there was a question further up. Um, somebody was asking for some clarification of how my mother got selected as the winner of the of the baby contest. If I um, am remembering that correct, correctly. yes, yes, yes. Do you want to talk to how the selection was made of the baby photo? I really don't know. There was no explanation given. It just appeared as a photograph. The magazine, I should tell you, was very scary. Inside, there were pictures of the Hitler Jugend around fireplace, marching band of Hitler, even Hitler saluting the troops. It was all very obviously very Nazi. How I got selected, especially not being blonde of the wine, who's always, always eluded us, anybody. And we should know, by the way, that at that point, nothing was published in Germany that did not have the approval of, um, uh, of the Ministry of Propaganda. This was strictly run by the Ministry of Propaganda, which is uh, propaganda machine. Yeah, and it, it, I should say that the three copies that my mother brought out from Europe, one is at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, as you know, Michael, and the other one at Senegal is in Nanya Vashem. The third copy I still have. Um, um, by oh. the way, someone who's a director producer uh, would love to be in touch with you to learn more. So I'm going to make that connection. She just put that in the chat chat section. Um, you, you never know what opportunities may come out of these things, but. Uh, um, Real quick, my dad, uh, so Hesse's related because she's my grandmother's first cousin, Sam, who is Florence, um, my late grandmother. Uh, he's on the Zoom call and he had excitedly texted me over and over to ask a question. Dad, can you unmute yourself to ask real quick? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, oh. Dad. <laughs> Hello. Hello, cousin Hesse. This is Florence's son, your cousin. Sam and Leah's dad too. How are you doing? Pretty good, thank you. Yeah, we got together 
last year for dinner with uh, your husband and I and my wife. Um, I remember uh, when I was in high school, uh, we got together with your father and my grandmother, your Aunt Bertha, in Long Beach at your, fa- your parents' house. And at dinner, they talked for about at least an hour about all the relatives in Libau. Uh, I guess the, my great-grandmother, Bassa, and an uncle, Bernhardt, and some other aunts. Uh, do you know about those relatives? And I guess they all apparently perished during the war. But have you heard anything about them or have family members from them? Yes, the only family member, there's one family member who's a descendant of Basel's side of the family. But that's not your side. That's my father's side. Landed up in South Africa. One person landed up in Israel, Mary Hoffman. She's uh, in the nursing facility in Israel, where, by the way, nursing homes are far better than they are here. <laughs> um, everybody else was one. My Aunt Ida was killed. Everybody else was killed, except uh, one cousin, Ida's daughter, who, by the way, Anna Rosa had two children, and she did name the other kid Hesse which is after the same grandfather. But the other Hesse was killed in the war. So only her older sister, Anna Rosa, whom your family, Berta, met in New York. Yes. And yes, we, knew. we knew Anna Rosa well, lovely woman. My Aunt Masha, yes, who got out to England. We survived the war in England are the only two survivors who I know of. Did we have a big family in Libau, do you know, before the war? Marie wants to say something about Bassa. Abassa. Yeah, Bassa was my great-grandmother. Actually, my I guess my mom's sister, Noemi, um, can uh, unmute for a moment. She can add something more about Bassa. Okay. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Noemi. Um, and my husband, Danny, and I were in Latvia, and we were presented in Lepaya, which is Libau, presented with a book. In Libaba, it was also known as. And um, we were presented with a book, a book about the Jews of Latvia, actually of Lepaya. And uh, in that book, shockingly, we literally saw our family listed as being shot on the beach on December 7th. And in there is Bassa. And Bassa was shot, as was most of our family. And I remember my mother had uh, six siblings and my father had something like six also. They all perished there. So, but but Nomi, the interesting thing is you will not get the other half of that story. Yeah. And that is that they, they were killed by Latvians, not by Germans. Exactly right. Exactly right. And it's interesting. And that- in the town book, I would bet my bottom dollar that that's not expressed. The 66, 000, of the 66,000 Jews in Latvia who were killed, the bulk of them were killed by Latvians, Correct. Uh, not, by, not by Germans. And for our synagogue, we also should know that German Jews were taken to Latvia, and on the wall of German Jews who were taken to Latvia is the name Ziggy Ziering. He was taken to Riga and then from there to Kaiserwald. So the irony is they were going in the other direction, and part of what they did in Latvia was to ship the Jews uh, from Germany to Latvia, where many were killed and the rest were put into uh, a concentration camp called um, uh, Lat- uh, called Kaiserwald. You know, Rabbi Baranov, this is exactly what my mother used to say. The Latvians were more anti-Semitic than the Germans even. 
but the only reason they didn't succeed better is because they were disorganized. Otherwise, they were, the Germans were the masters of anti-Semitism. Your mother was right. Yeah. Um, on a further note, uh, yeah, that beach where our an ancestors were shot, I think it's called Skate Aid Beach, they have a big memorial there that was put up by the Soviet government. And it talks about, it's a memorial, a very nice one, but it just talks about all the heroic Soviet citizens who died from the fascists during World War II there. Yeah, there are horrors. Today, the New York Times has an article about how the Poles suffered during the war and the Poles were the ones that were really suffering but mostly about a mayor of a small town who gave the Nazis a tip for 38 terrified Jews who were hiding. He probably got some compensation for it or will relieve himself. Anyway, the mayor of the town is dead now, but the memorials that were set up for all the Jews there that were the hiding and were exposed by the Poles. But, yeah, that, that's also a case in which there is a lawsuit now for libel against two historians, an Israeli and a Canadian, for libeling because they indicated that the mayor himself was, um, uh, was involved in the deaths. And under the new Polish law, you can sue civilly these people, and they have sued them civilly which is why all of this is coming to, um, coming to uh, attention. The historian, the Canadian, Canadian Jewish historian by the name of Jan Grabowski, Canadian Jewish Polish historian by the name of Jan Grabowski and it's coming out now in Poland. We have to be so vigilant and so careful. Maybe we have time for one to two more questions, Michael? Do we see any? Actually, tell me something. What are your memories of Cuba as a place? And Nomi, you can probably answer that as well. What was your experience in, in pre-Castro Cuba? Wonderful. It was so great. I, I hated the idea of coming to New York. I loved Cuba. I made great friends. I am... One of my dear classroom friends is the, one of my friends today in New York. Um, another is in Madrid. We still keep up friendships. But the interesting thing is that we were, the Cuban the aristocracy was very impressed by my sister and I because we were the little French girl. Las Francesitas, as they call it. But again, nobody would ever know that uh, they didn't know anything about Judaism. In fact, when I pointed out to them that I wear this six Morgan David, which I would, they all marveled, oh, what is that? It's got too many points. It's got six points instead of five. They didn't know nothing about Judaism, but they welcomed us tremendously for what we are. I want to add. It was very difficult for me to leave Cuba, I must say, especially for the hostile environment that was in New York. Yeah, I want to just add. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. yes. Uh, I just want to add that I uh, I agree with Tessie completely. It was my memory of Cuba was sunny happy place filled with music. And so in later years, I was in shock to even hear about the repressive government of Batista and everything else that happened after that because we were like in, I really, I think paradise. It was sunny, it was warm, the people were friendly, the music was from every street corner, the food was wonderful and look what happened. <laughs> so anyway. Well, 
let me add, let me add also something historically, which is um, when you piece together elements of the story, you have to understand that uh, your father got a visa for the family to the United States after Israel was established, and the pressure then came off that America would not have to receive the largest segment of the population of the displaced persons camp. And President Truman, who was pro-Jews um, and pro-survivors in terms of that, then was able to get through an expansion of the visas. And your father did it, uh, as, as I pieced together the story historically, what he did was he accepted the visas, came to the United States, and then went back to Cuba to settle his business affairs, but he made sure that the visas were done at that point. And it's an intriguing, that's the moment when many survivors came to the United States. You're talking about 48, 49, 50. By the way, coming to the United States at the same time were also ironically Nazi war criminals, especially if they came over from Europe. But from Cuba, they were not, they were not those. Right. He, he very effectively for a long time. I, uh, I just want to say maybe in parting again that to never forget is very important, not because it was so bad only as historic, I think, but because it could recur. It could recur very trivially with the slightest tick move. Jews are successful, hardworking. They believe one of the fundamental tenets of Judaism is to kill the land, which means to repair the world. It is a fundamental in Judaism to help others. But when they do, they seem to be criticized. Uh, un lived un disproportionately to every other country in the world. And when Jews are successful in, in uh, they cause the jealousy of non-Jews. So we have to be very careful about making sure that things are represented properly. Yes. Um, with that said, Michael, do you have any other comments or? Um... No, I, 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 I'm always struck by the irony of, again, uh, the irony of your earliest experience with this which is the Nazis were full of it. And here they had a dark haired, dark eyed, beautiful Jewish baby whom they decided was the most beautiful Aryan baby in the world, which uh, shows you what the hell they knew and uh, what the hell they pushed for. And again, um, we were always thrilled to have that document as it were, as a sense of irony and also thrilled to know that that little girl went through, again, uh, all of Europe, from Paris to um, Nice to uh, Marseille, across the Pyrenees into Spain, to Portugal, to Cuba, and then to the United States. And uh, that's, and again, her parents were, were Latvian to boot and that's part of uh, the incredible journey of modern Jewish history and part of the incredible determination to survive. And we come out of this with admiration for you. And we come out with your shared admiration for the innovation, creativity, guts, and everything else of your father. So thank you very much for sharing with us. My pleasure to be here, and I want to thank VA again and the Congregation, the congregation of Bay Dye for giving me this opportunity to talk to you and share you, not only my 
question of my concern, my history and my concern. Thank you. I just want to mention First of all, Hesse, thank you so much. It is always such a pleasure to reconnect with you and hear your story. And as always, Michael Barenbaum for being such a, so giving of your time and your expertise. And um, I put above a link and I'll do it again. Um, what got me to connect to Hesse again recently was uh, Der Spiegel, a major publication in Germany wanted to interview Hesse and so I, I made that connection. I just posted this article that they wrote about her, which is really excellent. Um, if you want to read it, um, you can translate it from German to English. But uh, I wanted to, to leave that with you. But uh, Leah, thank you for mentioning that because I wanted to say it was particularly gratifying to me that the German newspaper, prominent German newspaper, would be interested in my story. And so it proved that the fact that this is published in Germany is particularly gratifying to me. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, thank you um, on behalf of um, Michael and I and the rest of the community and, and the participants here. Thank you so much for your time. It was really, truly an honor to hear your story. Um, so I hope all of you tonight leave feeling inspired and take something away with you as you leave tonight and uh thank you again and um i hope all of you enjoy the rest of your evening thank you so much hesse very much thank you your, your conversation and their spiegel is translated translates immediately into english for those of you whose german is not fluent thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much Thanks for having me. Thanks. For Wonderful me. program. Thank you. Again. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Hesse. Hesse, I'll be in touch in the uh, tomorrow if it's okay to follow up with you. Absolutely. All right. Nina, it was such a pleasure to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you too. Thanks for organizing this, Leah. We'll be in touch. Absolutely. Good night, yeah. everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. And thank you for your interest.